I'm going to focus a little more specifically um, just because uh, um, this is, it can be a broad topic, and I think uh, it, at least with the treatment of um, the um, of epilepsy with uh, new uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy, um, there we're starting to get quite a few um, reports of, of outcomes, and, and it's an exciting um, part of the field. Um, let's see here. Waiting for my next slide. Um, generally, I would say this is a very exciting time in epilepsy to be in, uh, both for patients and especially uh, uh, to be a neurosurgeon. You know, we can really offer a lot, both in the way of diagnosis and treatment. Great. Is this, sorry, is this the uh, next, can I go to my next slide with it? Is this? Yeah, you're on Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Fabulous. I have no disclosures. Okay, great. Just briefly, um, epilepsy in general, um, this came up actually, I was reviewing um, some of the old talks, and, and, and just so we have a bit of a framework, uh, whenever patients come to us, the majority of these patients uh, will respond to medication. Uh, first medication we know from the, uh, the paper came out in the New England in Journal of Medicine 2000, that about 50% will respond to the first medication, the second medication around 10%, and then another 5% after the third medication. Really, after that, people don't really respond. And this is the caveat to this is that uh, they're appropriately managed uh, by epileptologists um, and that, um, um, uh, that they are tried. And, but a significant portion of those patients uh, won't respond to medication, will be pharmacoresistant. Um, when that happens, or when they're deemed to be uh, medically refractory, uh, which is still debatable, what that whether that's due to uh, intolerance of the medications, whether that's they continue to have seizures, or simply um, that um, uh, they feel that it interferes with their life, uh, those patients are appropriate for a surgical workup. Um, so this is one thing I really come to appreciate more and more uh, as a fellow. You actually have time to go to the meeting and really um, go through uh, the work of these patients. It can certainly be different uh, as a resident. You're kind of running around. You get bits and pieces. You're certainly there for the surgeries. But you don't really get to see these patients in clinic always and really think about, you know, um, the evaluation and the preoperative workup. And that is extremely important, um, both um, uh, one for just your own um, evaluation in your own um, uh, framework, but also if you don't have the right diagnosis, uh, it doesn't matter how good the surgery you do, uh, these patients won't be helped. Uh, and so this is extremely important and to really um, come to understand and get good at um, as a surgeon as well. So uh, whenever these patients come in, we really want to listen to their semiology. Patient comes in um, and they um, have a diagnosis in clinic of, of temporal lobe epilepsy and you're seeing them for um, uh, potential surgical workup, and you're talking to them, and, oh, we're going to do this, 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 and then they tell you, oh, yeah, you know, um, my seizures, I've got a lot of nocturnal seizures, I've got numbness um, in my hand and aura, then you think, wait a minute, let's just stop and, and really think about this, because your temporal lobe surgery might not help that patient. Um, so that's um, very important. We, um, we want to make sure the video EEG correlates um, both to the semiology, uh, to what we see electrographically and clinically. Uh, our MRI, uh, both um, our imaging is both going to be for anatomic uh, evaluation, but also for functional. Um, do we, uh, and then also our psychological testing, our WAD is going to tell us language dominance, it's going to tell us our memory uh, and what's going to be appropriate. Uh, patients uh, where they have bilateral memory impairment or uh, memory impairment on the time, type on the same side, uh, ipsilateral to the uh, hippocampal sclerosis, something's not quite right. They need further investigations or potentially, and if that turns out to be correct, the memory's discordant, um, you know, potentially they're not going to benefit from, sorry, they're not going to benefit from um, resection and maybe can it for stimulation. So these are all very important things to, to, uh, to consider. Um, intracranial EEG, um, if there's uh, some question whether the area needs to be mapped or further diagnosis. Uh, this is also very important. Um, you only are as good as um, uh, your evaluation as far as the information you get from your intracranial studies. You can't cover every aspect of the brain no matter how hard you try. So you really have to listen to your, seme your understand and listen to the patient as far as the semiology. You have to go over your, your EG. Uh, obviously, this is in a multidisciplinary uh, conference and, and try and figure out uh, where do we need to really look for that seizure onset or that epileptic focus.
So once you've done that, you've diagnosed the patient with temporal lobe epilepsy, how do those patients do? Well, you know, temporal lobe uh, surgery or temporal lobectomy is really the success story, or, or we think of it as uh, one of the real success stories as far as neurosurgery. We don't have a lot of randomized, controlled clinical data for many of the things we do. Um, but temporal lobe epilepsy and temporal lobe uh, surgery, we do. Uh, we should all, if we're going to take care of these patients, we, this is an article you have to know. Uh, this came out, um, I guess, in 2001. It was a Canadian study where they took 40 patients uh, and, and randomized them to either medical therapy with temporal lobe epilepsy to either medical therapy or surgical therapy, and then they saw how those patients did it. Uh, 12 months, and you can see that um, by, uh, by and large, the patients that had surgical intervention did much, much better as far as um, non, um, uh, or I'm sorry, as uh, far as seizure control. Um, and that's um, really um, some of the best evidence we have uh, for anything we do in neurosurgery. But so, so what's the problem? Um, you know, uh, depending on what study you quote, they'll quote between for a patient with um, especially uh, with either temporal of epilepsy and then even better, patients that have um, hippocampal sclerosis, people will quote between 60 uh, and 80 percent seizure freedom with 95 percent uh, significant improvement. So, you know, why are we still talking about this? Well, the problem is that there are uh, still patients that don't get better, uh, but there are patients uh, that have significant uh, neurocognitive problems. Um, certainly, if you look through, this is a review article that goes through all the series that looked at neurocognitive evaluations. This, this is specific to naming, uh, but neurocognitive evaluations um, of uh, patients that had temporal lobectomy, and they find some of them don't find significant problems, um, but the majority of them find uh, at least uh, some number of those patients between 10 to even as high as 50 percent. Uh, will have neurocognitive decline after temporal lobe um, surgery, especially dominant temporal lobe surgery. Um, it can be difficult when you're comparing. Certainly, we know about seizure freedom. Uh, that's pretty standardized uh, and uh, easy to compare or easier to compare the literature. Neurocognitive outcomes are, are more difficult uh, because it depends on the question you ask as far as the deficits that you find. But certainly, we know from our um, clinical experience and the data that's there, that um, patients do have neurocognitive decline after temporal lobe surgery. Um, and so we know, just to back up a little bit, um, we know from Pinfield and Wilder, uh, their work the earlier part of the last century, uh, that patients with temporal lobe epilepsy continue to have seizures if you just do a neocortical resection. Um, they found very quickly, uh, I think they uh, looked back at a large series of their patients, and they found that only 10 to 20 percent were seizure-free. Uh, when they only took the uh, lateral cortex. So they found very quickly that you have to take the mesial structures uh, for patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. And so um, this obviously became standard practice, uh, taking the mesial structures that uh, Dr. Rebus uh, so beautifully uh, just demonstrated. Uh, but because of the neurocognitive uh, declines, especially patients in uh, dominant um, temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, there's been many modifications of this in trying to spare the white matter. Um, he already mentioned uh, the uh, transylvian approach uh, described by Dr. Yastrigil. Um, people have described a subtemporal approach, uh, a subfrontal approach, even endoscopic uh, removal um, to try and uh, limit the neurocognitive insults uh, that these patients receive. Um, and, and the belief is that um, any the disruption of some people believe that it is the function of the uh, lateral cortex that you're actually damaging uh, that's causing the deficit. Other people uh, believe that it's actually responsible for disruption of the temporal stem and even um, uh, even um, some of the uh, or even the fusiform gyrus. Um, so um, and and really, they say that <clears throat> any uh, approach or any violation, you're disrupting something, um, <clears throat> even in the best hands. So. Uh, the balance, once again, is we know the more brain you remove, the less likely you are to seize, uh, but we know you're more likely to have uh, neurocognitive decline. And it's finding this balance, but if you don't, uh, if you do a very small surgery, you're less likely to benefit the patient as far as seizure control. So the balance here, and we struggle with this quite a bit, is uh, seizure freedom or seizure control versus neurological function. Uh, and that um, really, um, up until 
Recently, the debate was uh, which is better, um, anterior temporal lobectomy uh, or selective amygdalo hippocampectomy. And this was uh, a long debate. Um, if you go through, uh, this is a review article from 2000. 13 that looks at the results, and it finds pretty much uh, what we uh, think the uh, seizure freedom or seizure control is a little bit better for anterior uh, temporal lobectomy, um, and whether that's, uh, you know, sparing the superior temporal gyrus or um, uh, or in your length resection, um, the, still the, um, the uh, neuropsychological and neurocognitive uh, outcomes um, are a little bit better. Uh, for selective, um, but they're comparable. So that debate uh, was still raging uh, and, and still um, uh, alive um, until, I'd say, still pretty recently. But, and, and, and so uh, people are moving to less invasive ways uh, to address temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, here you have, um, there are certainly reports of uh, radiofrequency ablation. Uh, as late as, uh, or as early as 50 years ago, um, either just the amygdala or the hippocampal, um, or just the hippocampus or both. Um, and, um, but those kind of petered out, and, and certainly I, I would be uncomfortable uh, with any ablation, certainly, and we'll see the advantages with laser, but uh, you're very close to many critical structures and you don't have great control there. Uh, so ablating that entire complex while protecting all the vital structures around it uh, sounds uh, quite difficult, so that really isn't uh, alive. Um, there's a trial uh, by Dr. Regis um, uh, and others uh, for gamma knife therapy uh, for uh, the hippocampal, the uh, complex, the me uh, mesial structures. Um, those patients, uh, while uh, significant other of those had seizure control, uh, there's a lot of swelling, and you're waiting uh, for that um, radiation to take effect, and, and many of those patients um, had mass effect from the swelling, had worsening seizures uh, initially. Um, someone that I know that was involved in the trial compared it to having a, GB, a mesial temporal GBM for a few months, uh, and those patients had to have emergent temporal lobectomy. Um, so uh, certainly um, I'm not aware of anybody still doing that, um, but, um, and so that, that fell out of favor as well. So really right now, um, the debate, the, the new kind of player um, as far as temporal of epilepsy um, is, is uh, 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 laser ablation. Um, laser interstitial thermal therapy, uh, just to go back, I kind of didn't know this or I forgot about it, but laser means light amplification by stimulated emissions of radiation. Um, it was first reported uh, in the neurosurgical literature in 1966 uh, by neurosurgeons at uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, here you have a picture of the laser um, I, from their lab, I think that's great. Um, uh, this is a paper in neurosurgery 1966, uh, where initially they were uh, using it in animal models uh, and then used it on a patient uh, with a brain tumor. Um, they uh, did note on the histological um, uh, review that it has a very isolated uh, or very uh, well delineated uh, damage zone, um, uh, but they also noted that you really couldn't uh, tell uh, what was damaged when. Uh, so uh, it really um, continued to be used, and I'm sure we have all seen it used in our training in handheld device. People use it for meningiomas, um, uh, and, but really just what you can see. And so that was one of the big problems. You can't really, um, you, it doesn't have a lot of advantage if you don't actually uh, know what damage you're causing. Um, it was first uh, introduced in just the tumor literature, not necessarily necessarily neurosurgical in 1983 when uh, they used it in an um, uh, endoscope uh, to treat tumors or propose that. And then finally in the neurosurgical literature uh, with a Japanese group uh, that described laser interstitial therapy uh, through fiber optics uh, in several brain tumors. And so why, so why can't we use this now and what's really pushed this technology or, or method? And two things really, one is MR thermography, and this has really changed the game um, for uh, quite a few things in uh, epilepsy and functional neurosurgery. Um, Dr. Monteith will be talking to you uh, about focused ultrasound, uh, and that's also um, something that has been enabled, an old technology, something that was around for 50 years that nobody could really use because of a few um, technological problems that have, has really come back into the forefront um, because of um, one of the things, which is MR thermography, and this allows you to measure the um, real-time uh, temperature um, of the tissue you're heating up. 
Um, and as the laser emits light, it absorbs by the tissue, um, and it, um, it, it causes an increase in temperature. That temperature, we know um, from our studies, um, uh, that the damage or the denaturing of protein uh, at certain temperatures is one, it's heat dependent, but also time dependent. So under 45 degrees, some say 42 degrees, really, um, that um, you won't have, everything is irreversible. So you can get temporary stunning, but you won't actually kill the tissue. Anything from 45 to 60 is a nice controlled time-dependent damage uh, occurs. Um, uh, and then over 60 uh, degrees is rapid. Once you get above 90 degrees, and this is, uh, these numbers are important if you're going to be doing this um, to know, uh, in that anything above nine, you get charring of the tissue, you don't get absorption, you can get rapid damage to far off areas, and, and uh, it's more of a logistics or practical point, you can actually melt your catheter in there and, and have it uh, stick to things, can't get out, tear something. Uh, so those are numbers you need to know about. Um, does anybody do, uh, what is it, sous vide or sous vide? Nobody does that? Same thing here, if you keep a steak in a, in a 52 degree water bath, it'll be perfectly cooked at uh, 60 minutes. So same, same principle. So um, there are two uh, available uh, um, products as far as uh, laser neurocentral thermal therapy for neurosurgery. There's the Visual Ace, uh, which um, we use here. Uh, it's a 980 nanometer uh, wavelength, and then uh, it was FDA approved in 2007. Uh, and the FDA approval is for ablation within uh, neurosurgery or within the brain. Uh, not necessarily specific to epilepsy treatment. Um, that basically is a, a single catheter that we're going to show you guys today where you place it stereotactically within the, the brain. It's also used by um, some um, centers for um, uh, spinal metastasis, uh, but it's placed in and it emits um, a beam that's uh, one centimeter radius um, in all directions around, a little bit anterior, but mostly around. And as you pull it back, you get a nice uh, kind of sausage or, or a string of pearls ablation along whatever your target is. Uh, the Neuroblate uh, is a little bit different. Um, it's uh, 1,064 nanometer, and also FDA, for, uh, FDA approved for uh, ablation within uh, the brain. Um, and uh, it's a little different in that there's two options. You have the similar um, uh, uh, circular ablation, but also a steerable. You certainly see that uh, more prevalent in the on oncologic literature, the neuro-oncologic literature. Um, some of our attendees have used that. I have not, so maybe they could talk to you more about it. Uh, so how do these patients actually do? And this is specific to um, mesial temporal, uh, patients with mesial temporal of epilepsy uh, that are treated with uh, laser interstitial ther therapy. Um, this, uh, most of this uh, data is coming out of Emory. Dr. Gross has really pioneered, uh, and Dr. Wiley uh, as well, have really pioneered uh, this technique and have published quite a bit on it. The first report of it actually being used in epilepsy uh, was from Dr. Curry uh, at Ch uh, Texas Children's. Um, and, you know, if you look at the, um, this is just a review. Dr. Curry just had one patient at one um, year. Uh, this, uh, the patient was an Ingalls class one. Uh, Dr. Wiley really uh, presented the first series of these patients. Um, and it's important to, to note here, um, the seizure uh, in the patients with mesial temporal sclerosis, it was 67% uh, that were Ingalls one um, at uh, median of 14 month follow-up. Uh, all takers were 54%, but one of the things that they did have was there was one patient, um, they had two complications, one patient uh, and they're not exactly sure. They speculate that in placing the catheter uh, that it was um, misdirected, and they believe, although they didn't have radiographic evidence of this, they believe they injured the lateral geniculate body, and the patient um, had a um, homonymous hemianopsia, not quadrantinopsia, but homonymous uh, hemianopsia. Um, and that was one patient. Um, and then the other patient had a subdural that they noticed on MRI scan. It had to be evacuated, but had no neurosurgical energy, uh, injury. So uh, that is one thing that comes up uh, when you talk about patients that do epilepsy surgery. They, they see that, that and they think, well, you know, we'll have to wait and see because um, at least those numbers are still um, low to, uh, for a homonymous hemianopsia. And it's, it's certainly one thing to, to uh, be mindful of. Um, 
Other uh, outcomes, Dr. Uh, Drain's paper, we'll talk about more of that uh, shortly. Um, and then um, Dr. Uh, Wasim, uh, another um, uh, series of patients that had similar uh, Ingalls um, or seizure control um, at uh, 12 months. Uh, another, ooh, let's see here. Oh boy. There we go. Uh, another paper um, that's out of Johns Hopkins and uh, neurologist out of Johns Hopkins, but um, um, the surgeries are all done at Jefferson. Uh, similar results, um, just under uh, 50% for seizure control. Uh, they only had neuropsychological uh, evaluations of six of the patients, and two of those patients had decline in some of their evaluations. Once again, um, I'm finding, and, and as I'm learning more and more, uh, it really depends what questions uh, you ask and, and what uh, series uh, you're evaluating. Um, but they did have some um, neurological, uh, neurocognitive decline uh, after surgery. Um, and that, but um, this is a really um, important paper uh, to know about. Uh, and this was Dr. Drain's evalu um, paper um, where um, Dr. Uh, Gross uh, at Emory, Dr. Wiley, uh, worked with Dr. Ogerman, um here at, at uh, University of Washington. And they took, nine, I believe it was about 19 patients that had laser needle stitchal therapy uh, compared to uh, near 40 patients that had uh, anterior temporal lobectomy. Um, and they uh, compared those patients for uh, neurocognitive uh, outcomes after. Um, and what they found was they, they proposed that patients that have uh, dominant temporal lobe epilepsy and have um, temporal lobectomy are going to have decline or more decline um, in their um, naming, um, as opposed to patients that have non-dominant, which um, they said will be affected uh, more with um, facial recognition. Um, and they postulated uh, uh, disruption of uh, the uh, ILF and IFOF. Um, and, and that is indeed what they found uh, and what they reported. The uh, graph there on the left, they're all the uh, green pointing down are the neurocognitive outcomes uh, for patients uh, that had temporal lobectomy. And then the ones on the right are the ones that had laser interstitial therapy. So some of those patients actually got better uh, as opposed to the ones um, that had temporal lobectomy, which they show all got worse. Um, so that's um, certainly compelling. Um, and uh, and certainly a reason to, to look for uh, further into uh, these outcomes. But uh, and, and really, if that is what's happening, that's amazing. Um, but still, I think uh, maybe a little early to tell. Uh, this is just a case. This is a 30-year-old male that comes into your clinic with a 15-year history of complex partial seizures, uh, poor seizure control, and multiple medications despite adhering to that regimen. Um, video EG shows left frontal temporal onset. The MRI has left um, uh, hippocampal sclerosis, and the WADA shows that the patient is uh, left dominant with poor memory. Um, or uh, actually, let's take that part out. Let's leave the memory fine. But the patient says, uh, there is no way I want any risk of having any delay in my speech. Um, you know, I speak publicly. Um, I can't be looking for words. Um, so this patient, I would say, uh, would be a, a good candidate for uh, uh, laser interstitial therapy. So uh, this little bit of the workflow, um, you would uh, have preoperative MRI before. Um, and then in your planning, um, this is something we're still working on. But your planning, and just to go back, a few of the papers have looked at seizure outcomes in their patients uh, relative to actual ablation volumes, and they haven't really found a correlation. Um, some of the patients are seizure-free, and the other patients aren't, uh, but they haven't really found a correlation of this percentage of the amygdala, this percentage of the hippocampus. Um, it, once again, these are very small numbers, but um, most people uh, will advocate or will aim for the um, anterior uh, or the hippocampal uh, head and then the portion of the amygdala but how do you get there? If you just think about, well, I want to get as much as possible, I have a straight line, you, you might think about doing something like that, but you're going to miss the amygdala. Uh, you might say, well, I'm going to get all the amygdala, just the hippocampal head, but then you're going to miss quite a bit of the body. So really, it's, kind of, it's basically a uh, almost parasagual-oriented uh, medially, uh, and then you really... Um, and then along the, uh, the track there, uh, you can't really see it on this image, but 
Um, we struggle, the higher you are, uh, you have one centimeter on each side, so placing the, the catheter exactly where you're going to get the most ablation while you feel you're going to be farther away from critical structures like especially the roof of the ventricle, something we always worry about uh, in an attempt to avoid giving someone um, homonymous hemianopsia, um, or um, things uh, like if you're going to be too mesial, uh, too close to the brainstem, once again, vessels, um, uh, CSF spaces act as heat sinks, uh, but uh, it, it, uh, you wouldn't want to find out uh, the hard way. So uh, once we have our planning, we take the patient uh, to the operating room. There's multiple, multiple ways. You can put in uh, the catheter. Basically, any stereotactic um, system is compatible. Uh, we, you can use the Lexel frame. You can use the next frame, CRW. We use um, the... Brain Lab uh, with the Vario Guide. We use that for stereo EG as well. We like that workflow. Uh, and then also you can use um, the uh, ClearPoint system, which would be nice in that you could put it in and, and do the ablation right there if you have that capability. Once we have our catheter in place, we get a CT scan in the operating room to confirm uh, the location of that. That's something I think that Really, now with O-arm, uh, with you may or may not have an intraoperative CT, but especially with O-arm, uh, you certainly uh, want to confirm that, if possible, uh, in the operating room so you can um, make any adjustments before you take the patient off, take them down to the MR, uh, and do an ablation. The uh, one thing that I would say about this that's different and that you may not be used to um, as opposed to, say, DBS, where you're doing a burr hole, and it really doesn't matter as far as too much as far as your bony work as long as it's not touching. This is your trajectory is completely determined by your, your bolt, uh, uh, your bone anchor. So that's another thing with stereo EG. You're really just using your frame to put your bone anchor in place, and then you're committed to that trajectory. So if there's any wobbling around, if you're not paying attention, you kind of walk down with the drill, you're going to be completely off. Um, so that's something to think about and can be a little futzy and can be difficult to get used to. So we take the patient uh, to the uh, MRR, uh, MRI suite. Uh, we get them in there. We hook up our laser. Uh, we start to do our ablation. We'll go over this more in detail in the uh, demonstration. Uh, but really, um, you see there you can get the uh, images. You want your axial and your coronal, or I'm sorry, your sagittal plane along the axis of the uh, catheter. Uh, coronal, I was, you know, we doing a case like, why don't we just look at this in the coronal? Because that'd be nice to see uh, the midbrain or see our mesial structures. Well, as you pull the catheter back, you lose that frame. So it's really, if you're going to be pulling back, you have to be along the axis of the, of the catheter, and that's only going to be sagittal and, and axial. So you see there at uh, D, uh, you, you see, you have two images. You have your actual uh, or your live uh, heat uh, map on your thermography, and then you have E is is your historical uh, lesion. So um, you're watching both of those. Um, before you actually start, you're going to set both your um, low safety markers. So you're going to mark out things like the roof of the uh, lateral ventricle where your optic uh, radiations are going to be. You're going to map out uh, maybe, uh, say, your uh, peduncle or your um, ambient cistern um, to make sure that doesn't get above 45 degrees. Um, if it does, the whole system will shut down. And then you're going to set your high markers, which are going to be along the catheter, and that's going to be your 90 degrees. And so if it gets above that, you can melt your, uh, your uh, sheath. You can um, cause unpredictable damage, and so you're going to mark, uh, mark those as well. If it gets above that, the whole system will shut down. So then you're just going to, you're going to do your ablations. Once you're satisfied with that, you're going to uh, send your resident or fellow in, pull that back a little bit, do the ablation again. Uh, repeat, check, repeat, check. Uh, at the end of it, we remove the catheter, take the bolt out, uh, just put a staple in. We do another MRI follow-up, um, and then the patient's in the IC overnight. And it really it is, uh, this part of it is amazing. The patient goes home almost, uh, yeah, every, all of our patients have gone home the next day. Um, so that really is amazing. Um, I'm not really sure where we are on the, uh, the curve here. I'll let you decide. Um, but uh, this is uh, it's, uh, certainly an exciting time, and um, I'll take any questions. Yeah.